Hello? Hello? Good Ralph morning. and Shirley? Hello? Hello. Hi. Hello. I've got a clear line today by the sounds of it. How are you doing? Yes, not too bad, thank you. The problem uh, the other day was at my end. I think they were doing upgrade work, so I do apologise. I had a... Uh, a call from a friend later and the same thing happened so I, I figured out they must be doing upgrade work all the time they do email me occasionally and I just ignore right. the email they'll not email text me about upgrade work and that's what it must have been so I do apologize for Monday that's okay I'm sorry it was so shambolic it was almost <laughs> to try and get some idea um, but anyway what can we do for you Robert I mean well I've looked again at your text to Lee um, you know where, where do you find yourself spiritually? You said you used to attend church. What would you like to ask us? Um, yes, I'm curious about your book, Enjoy Life Forever. I've been dipping in and out of a few chapters. Maybe it might be possible to look at just one chapter um, rather than try and do several, um, which might be a bit much. I've been looking at chapter 15, um, I notice it talks about Jesus being firstborn there, Colossians 1.15. And I thought, hmm, I, I'm not quite so sure I would see that as meaning Jesus is created. So that's one thing. Chapter 7 talks about the Holy Spirit as God's active force. That's another thing. And there's another chapter in Enjoy Life Forever. I think it's 18 or 19. Uh, it talks about Jehovah choosing the Watchtower Society or... They, they being his representative. So there's a couple of things I've been looking at. Right. Um, could I ask, um, do you have any particular preference in terms of the Bible? Because, I mean, sometimes I find that those, particularly with perhaps an evangelical background, feel that the, uh, the only Bible is the King James Bible. Is that the way you feel, or are you happy with um, any translation that, you know, I know some are very, very loose, but um, a modern English translation. Um, I've got the New King James in front of me. I'm happy with the New American Standard, New Revised Version. The NIV is a little bit, as you say, loose, but I'm happy with that one too. Right, OK. Well, yeah. that definitely helps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you, you mentioned the name Jehovah. I, I take it you're not uncomfortable with that name as, as it's to be found in the King James Version. I would see Yahweh as more, more accurate. I remember reading in um, your literature, I went to jw.org, um, and it did oh. say that Yahweh was a more accurate name rendering than Jehovah. Jehovah comes from a Catholic monk called Raimondo Martini, who um, yeah, I really came, up with the, he with, came up with the word Jehovah in, I think it was the 13th century. Um, right, well, yeah, that, that was very much the time at which the, the Bible was translated from, I think, Latin through to English. Um, but, I mean, um, obviously at that time to Jesus and all the other apostles' names were translated through. But it, it identifies the God of the Bible. But as you say, um, I mean, Yahweh is probably actually a more accurate rendering. And then if you look at Jesus, probably something like Yeshua. Um, there's always a problem with translating languages, particularly with names. Right. Oh. My, my only insistence would be whichever chapter you want to look at, um, I insist that we read that relevant section. I, I don't like, and I don't like paraphrasing the Bible. I don't like people saying, oh, the Bible says blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it, it, you need to be pacific. So we actually yeah. read Bible texts. We don't paraphrase them to each other. And yeah. I, I, your book, Enjoy Life Forever, I think you actually need to read it. So we have some structure. Otherwise, we're just going to be, I don't want to jump around like the Mexican jumping bean. So... Okay. Um, well, obviously, we we take the Bible as a whole, and I, I would certainly agree with you. I mean, at the end of the day, the Bible is the ultimate authority. I mean, as far as we're concerned, you know, I'm, I'm sort of ex-mechanic, as far as I'm concerned, the, the Bible is the workshop manual to life, as it yep. were, and we, we look to it as the directive for Christianity 
rather than um, what obviously the, I mean, there are a great many traditions. Ralph, been... Ralph, which which chapter of Enjoy Life Forever would you like to look at? Would you want to look at? Should, should we do that? Should we look at the Holy Spirit? It, by all means, well, yeah. I'll leave it to your choice. I mean, okay. what, what would you prefer to consider first? All right, we'll, we'll do that one, although I'm also looking at Chapter 15 and Chapter 18 and 19 for another time. Um, I've got it in front of me. I don't have the paper copy of the book. I've downloaded it. It's Chapter 7, and it's Section right. 4, Holy Spirit Dash God's Active Force. Right. Now, let me just get there. Right, yes. Yep, OK, right. So... Um, so what what would be the points that you'd like to make on that? Uh, you know, what, that's how we see it. And when you, for instance, read um, in Genesis about um, could could we the, could we read the section so we have some structure? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Holy Spirit dash God's active force. Just as we use our hands to do work, Jehovah uses His Holy Spirit. The Bible reveals that the Holy Spirit is not a person, but a force God uses to get things done. Read Luke and Acts. Then discuss these questions. God will pour out his Holy Spirit on those who ask for it. So do you think Holy Spirit is a person, or is it God's active force? Why do you say that? Jehovah uses his Holy Spirit to accomplish amazing things. Read Psalm 33, 6 and 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 to 21, and then discuss this question, what are some ways in which Jehovah has used his Holy Spirit? Thank you for allowing me to read the section. Thank you. No, it's fine. Okay, so um, what would you like to do? Would you like to look at the individual scriptures and see what they contribute, or do you feel that there are others that need to have a bearing on the subject? Well, I, I think it's fairly, with respect, I, I think what I've read is fairly meaningless because terms aren't defined unless you define your terms and you define what do Trinitarians mean by person or what is God's active force what is an active force unless you define those terms then you can't even have a conversation conversation is not going to happen it's no point even looking at the Bible and trading scriptures unless you define what are we talking about absolutely I would agree totally my understanding of the Trinity, um, from what I've read of church dogma, is three persons in one co-equal, co-eternal. Would that be your understanding? Well, what do, when you say three persons, what do you mean? I, w I, would, I would be a Trinitarian, yes, but one of the mm. things that caused me to leave the church in 2010, apart from, well, things that were shocking... Um, the second thing that caused me to leave the church was the doctrine of the Trinity. I found that most of the evangelical churches I had tried out, um, the leaders had not a clue about the Trinity. Oh dear, that sounds rather sad. Right, yeah. OK. So um, what I, then... I was told over and over and over again that Jesus is the Father, which of course is modalism, not the Trinity. Right, so what's your concept then? I mean... How do you see the, the three characters that are normally associated with the Trinity, the Godhead? What, what's your con concept? Well, um, I would uh, agree with what you what you defined earlier on the Trinity that there's one single Godhead. He's one being. He's one essence. But the, but but that this one God exists personally, distinctly, and eternally as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when I use the word personally, what I mean is that the Father is revealed as a he, not an it. The Son is revealed as a he, not an it. And the Holy Spirit is revealed as a he, not an it. Um, I have spoken to people in the past and they assume that the term three persons means that Trinitarians believe that God is three separate people or three separate human beings. That's, that's not what the Trinitarian creeds mean at all. They simply use the word person to mean personal that Father is a He, Son is a He, Holy Spirit is a He. They're not three it's. They're revealed to us in personal ways. Um, and they would be distinct, not separate. That's, that's quite an important part of the Trinitarian creeds. Because if they're separate, and um, God is spirit, John 4.24, 
So if Father, Son and Holy Spirit are a spirit and they're separate, then you have three separate gods. You have tritheism. And that, again, that's another another thing I've come across so often. Um, uh, it's quite uh, shocking. Okay. Um, right. So I think we're beginning to sort of establish the, the groundwork. Um, how do you see... Um, right. Well, our concept is that Jehovah is the ultimate God. He is forever. He's always existed. He always will exist. Um, and... Uh, our understanding from the scriptures, where the scriptures speak regularly of Christ as the firstborn uh, of all creation, it is that he is the first creation of the uh, the, the true God Jehovah, the the, the, the grand creator, uh, as he's referred to in, in um, Revelation 4.11, the worthy one. Um, the, I mean, it, it's very seldom in the scriptures that um, anything more than Jehovah and Jesus are linked together um, and certainly we don't find um, on a regular basis uh, the concept of, of three uh, equal beings no, 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 no the Trinity teaches God is one being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one being, with one mind, one essence, one being, one will. Not three beings. That's 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 tritheism. Um, you mentioned Colossians one fifteen, and I said that that was mentioned in your book, Enjoy Life Forever, on chapter fifteen. But I wanted to do one thing at a time. Okay. Okay. Because if we jump like the Mexican jumping bean. We're just going to be changing the topic all the time. Could we discuss the Holy Spirit? Okay. Now, uh, because I mean, what do what did Jehovah's Witnesses mean by an active force? What I think you mean is the Holy Spirit is an it, not a he. That would, I think, be a fairly correct summation. Yes, um, we we don't see it as an individual who has choice, uh, um, free will, he is the extension uh, extension of Jehovah's uh, will, it, it's his active force as we see in Genesis where it was moving to and fro over the surface of the earth. Um, well, in, in Genesis 1-2, it, it, the, the Hebrew, I'm, I'm not a Greek or Hebrew scholar, obviously, I'm just an ordinary person, um, but I do try to learn from people cleverer than myself. And all of the scholars say that the Hebrew reads the Spirit of God in Genesis 1-2, not God's active force. That, that phrase, God's active force, is, is never used anywhere in the Greek or Hebrew text. And no translation by a biblical scholar holding a PhD in Greek or Hebrew, uh, to my knowledge, ever translates um, into the English language the Holy Spirit as God's active force or, or, or active force. Unless, of course, you can correct me, unless you can show me any scholar with a PhD in Greek or Hebrew who, who's translated it that way. Um, to me, when I look at the Bible, Ralph, hmm. I would see the Holy Spirit, and I'm happy to discuss the Trinity on another occasion, but I like to do one thing at a time and yeah. prepare. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. I, I'm not going to get any, 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 anything out of this. Um, there are four aspects of personality. Four aspects that, to me, make the difference between a he and an it. And I'd see those four aspects of personality being applied to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is a human being, because these aspects of personality would apply to God, to, well, to, to, the, to the Father. I think we could both agree the Father is God. Um, to, to the angels, to the demons, even to Satan himself. Um, we would all agree that Father, the angels, demons, and Satan are, are spirits. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think from my reading of Jehovah's Witness literature, again, I don't wish to get sidetracked, but you believe Jesus rose as a spirit creature. I would say he rose in the same body he died in. But you would say Jesus rose as a spirit creature. So you'd say the Father is a spirit and he's a person. 
you'd say the son is a spirit, he's a person. The angels are each individual spirits, they're persons. Satan and his demons, they're each individual spirits and they're persons. But then when you come to the Holy Spirit, you'd say the Holy Spirit is a spirit, but he's not a person. And that troubles me, Rolf, because it, it appears to me to be, a, a, a well, sir, a little inconsistent. Okay, um, right. Well, I, I mean, I would say the same as you. We're not Hebrew and Greek scholars. We, mm -hmm. We've tried to investigate it. I mean, we're ordinary people. Uh, and I'm certainly not a walking encyclopedia. Um, we, we try to be familiar with our beliefs and uh, 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 if we hit questions that we're not familiar with the answers, we're, we're always happy to do the research um, and come back on it. But um, I thought perhaps a scripture that you may find interesting to look at mm -hmm. is chapter 3. You know, I am thinking on my feet here. Yeah. Uh, right, so uh, how about Matthew chapter 3? Uh, um, Verse 11, um, I for my part baptize you with water because of your repentance, but the one coming after me is stronger than I am, whose sandals I'm not worthy to take off, which is speaking of John the Baptist. That one will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. Mm -hmm. um, so that that gives me the feeling of a, a an extension of Jehovah's capability. Um, the other one that I find interesting on these lines is Matthew chapter three, verse sixteen and seventeen, mm -hmm. um, which is of course at Christ's baptism. After being baptized, Jesus immediately came up from the water and looked, the heavens were opened up, and he saw God's Spirit descending like a dove and coming upon him. Uh, and look also, a voice from the heaven said, This is my Son, the beloved whom I have approved. Now, there we have mention of all three aspects that we're discussing. It, it would appear that the Spirit came down like a dove and empowered uh, a physical human being who'd chosen to do his Father's will. Um, this is my son whom I have approved. How does that strike you? Oh, I certainly would agree the Holy Spirit um, came down. Um, I think that the main purpose of that was to um, indicate to to the people there who Jesus was, or probably to John the Baptist, but I, I would certainly agree with that there. The fact that um, we read in verse 11, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Fire, I think, refers to judgment, probably. Um, remember that people were baptized unto Moses... I think that's 1 Corinthians 10. Oh, gosh. I'm getting old, my... <laughs> uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2. Um, I'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So... People were baptized unto Moses. It's simply a commission for service. Um, and that's probably what's happening in John 3, just as um, in um, 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 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, which is the verse I read, people were baptized unto Moses. It's just a commission for service, I think. Um, People are baptized unto Christ in Romans 6, 3. Uh, uh, Romans 6, 3. Or do you not know that as many as, as of us as were baptized unto Jesus Christ, into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? That's Romans 6, 3. So people can be baptized into Christ, Romans 6, 3, or baptized un, it, unto Moses. 1 Corinthians 10 2. I think it's just a commission for service. But I certainly would agree the Holy Spirit did descend upon Jesus. Um, mm. 
um, rather confusingly. Well, let me take that back. Um, he appeared to descend upon Jesus, and it was a way of identifying Jesus to John the Baptist, because Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, being one God, um, would always be unified, never separate. So Jesus didn't sort of receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, you know, the Holy Spirit was separate to him. And then in John 3, this separate being who was separate to Jesus suddenly came down and alighted upon him. Um, so I'm not saying Jesus and the Holy Spirit are separate, but that's a little bit of a technical point. Um, sorry, I've talked quite a lot. I beg your well, pardon. No. I mean, at the end of the day, unless we have a reasonable grasp of what you, you personally feel, um, we we can't really make sense of an, a reply. Um, and it, I'll be honest and say it's a very long time since I've spoken to anyone who had anything like as much of a grasp of the scriptures as you obviously have. You've obviously taken it seriously and... Uh, I don't think I've come across anyone who uh, can move around the scriptures as, uh, as I hope we're able to. And usually our, our struggle is trying to convince people that maybe there is a creator after all, when in fact they're taught at school that, that you know, God doesn't exist. Um, so, yeah, uh, forgive me if I'm rusty. <laughs> no, no, that, no that, that, that's okay. I mean, notice John 3.17. Uh, this is a point that I would wish to go on to if you want me to go through my four, four because I've got scriptures why I think the Holy Spirit is personal, not impersonal. Um, right. I'm reluctant to use the word person because, as I say, if I say God is three persons, people are going to think, and I'm not saying that you would think this, Ralph, but people often come to the conclusion that I believe in three separate people. You know, like three people sitting on a seat. You have three separate beings. That, that's, that's not what I believe at all. The Trinitarian creeds would, would talk about persons, three persons, but what they mean is personal, that Father is a he, Son is a he, Holy Spirit is a he. Now notice in verse 17, Matthew three seventeen, the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father uses the pronoun I, Forgive me, I'm just catching up with you. I got John by chance. Sorry. Uh, this, this is my son, the beloved, whom I have approved. Yeah. So the father uses the pronoun I. Now, I would see four things that prove that the Holy Spirit surely is personal rather than impersonal. The first is a long word, self-cognizance. It just means you recognize your own existence. So when I speak to you, Ralph, and I use the pronoun I, or I talk about my phone, I'm looking at my phone right now, and in front of me I have my Bible. When I use those pronouns, I, my, as in my phone, or my Bible, or, or it's mine, it belongs to me, it's mine. When I use um, especially the pronoun I, I'm recognising my own existence. And that's called self-cognizance. Now, the father does that in John, John 3, 17. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But the Holy Spirit does that in Acts 13, 2, where he uses the pronouns me and I. If you want to go to Acts 13, 2. Yeah. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. When the Holy Spirit uses the pronouns me and I, he's recognizing his own existence. That's called self cognizance. Now, something that's impersonal, an it, or what we would call an impersonal thing like a rock, a stone, electricity, cannot speak and say, I, me, mine. I think there was a, a Beatles song from Let It Be, I, me, me, mine. Oh, so um, uh, it wasn't a very good song, actually. Uh, I, me, me, mine. I just kept repeating those pronouns over and over again. I, me, me, mine. Well, I, me, me, mine are pronouns which can only be used by someone who is personal. A rock can't say I, me or mine. 
A stone, a pile of mud, can't say I, me or mine, and neither can electricity. Only a person, a he or a she, can use the pronouns I and me, because to do that you're recognising your own existence, which the Father does in John 3.17. You can't say the Father isn't it. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. If the Father isn't it, he couldn't use the word I. He uses the word I because he recognises himself as personal not impersonal, and that's called self-cognizance, and that's repeated by the Holy Spirit in Acts 13 too. Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Right, okay. Um, so we're talking very much in terms of personification, as it were. I wonder how you feel about the words of Proverbs chapter 8. Um, and verse 1 through to chapter 9, verse 6, where we have wisdom being um, spoken of as though it is a person. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 8 and verse 1 is not wisdom calling out, it's not discerning, raising its voice. Um, it, Sorry, could you just say that again? Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 1 through to chapter 9 and verse 6. Um, um, we need to read the first three verses. Does not wisdom cry out and, and understanding lift up her voice? She takes uh, her stand on the top of the high hill beside uh, the way which the paths meet. Verse 3, she cries out by the gates at the entry of the city. So uh, wisdom is here likened to a woman who, yeah. in verse 12, lives in a house with another woman called Prudence. Oh, indeed. And in, in, 12, uh, no, in chapter 9, verse 1, Wisdom has built her house. She has, she has hewn out her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. So the feminine pronoun she is used, but this Wisdom, who lives in a house with Prudence, uh, this house has seven pillars. I think this is, um, it's a kind of just an idiom. It's its not supposed to be taken literally. It's simply a personification of God's, God's, God's wisdom, who in verse 1 is said to go out in the streets and cry out in the streets. Proverbs one twenty: wisdom cries, at, cries aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open square. She cries out in the chief concourses, at the opening of the gates in the street. She speaks her words. Um, in the Bible, God always refers to himself with masculine pronouns. Not that God, who is spirit, is either masculine or pronoun, but because of the principle of male headship, that's why the masculine pronoun is used. If wisdom refers to God in some sense, or to Jesus or to the Holy Spirit, um, the masculine pronoun would be used, not the feminine she. And I think that what you're dealing with here is just um, a poetic reference to God's wisdom. Whereas in the passage I showed you uh, in, in Acts chapter 2, and in the passage which you raised about the baptism of Jesus in, in um, Matthew 3.17, those are those aren't poetic books like the book of Proverbs. That's plain teaching, you know, plain teaching in the book of Acts and plain teaching about Jesus's baptism in Matthew three seventeen. So I don't really see this as just being related. I think this is a personification of wisdom, God's 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 wisdom. Enough. I can appreciate the point you're making. Um, I can't say I see it the same way. Um, but... I mean, because not... we could we could take Proverbs eight and we could say that God is not personal. We could say God is impersonal. I mean, you, if you go to a po poetic book of the Bible and you you start there, Ralph. Well... and you then go to the New Testament and you interpret the New Testament in the like like of in the light of some poetic verse from the Old Testament, you can make the New Testament mean whatever you want. I think we have to start in the clear verses, which would be in the New Testament, and then we try and harmonize the rest of the Bible. Um, I used to be a oneness Pentecostal, which you've probably never heard of. No, I can't 
can't say I have. I'm aware of Pentecostals, but not that specific definition. Um, they're also known as apostolic, Jesus only, oneness Pentecostals. They they number far far more than Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons combined. Um, they're tens and tens of millions. Um, but um, because of the age in which we live, um, even though they're anti-Trinitarian, um, oneness Pentecostals are just accepted now. They just play down their their oneness beliefs and they're accepted by the other Pentecostals. About a quarter of all traditional Pentecostals around the world are oneness Pentecostals. They deny the Trinity. And when I was in that group in the, in the, in the 1980s, I was only in it for nine or ten months and then I left actually po probably a little bit less than that um, we would nearly always start in some vague passage from the Old Testament establish the oneness belief from Psalms or Proverbs or some poetic book from the Old Testament and then having misunderstood a verse in the Old Testament then we use that as a battering ram. We go to the New Testament and we just use it as a battering ram to destroy any clear teaching, clear didactic teaching from the New Testament that, that disagreed with it. Um, for instance, I'll, I'll give you an example of a oneness Bible study. Isaiah 9, 6. I won't read the whole verse because I don't want to get sidetracked. But it says that the son who is given an obvious reference to Jesus Christ, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. And then it says, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So one as Pentecostals take you to Isaiah 9, 6, Jesus Christ is the Everlasting Father. That means Jesus is God the Father. So there's no Trinity. There's just Jesus. Jesus is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's called modalism, sabellianism. Today it's known as oneness or the apostolic movement. So you use that one verse. You might want to back it up with Deuteronomy 6, 4. There's only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Does it say there's three gods? No, there's only one God. So who is the one God? Isaiah 9, 6 is Jesus. Jesus is the one God. Jesus is the Father. Jesus is the Son. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And they misinterpret Isaiah 9, 6 that Jesus, the Son who is given, is the everlasting Father, which doesn't mean God the Father. It means the creator or the possessor of eternity, but they misunderstand that. And then whatever you showed them from the New Testament, no, not interested, because Isaiah 9, 6 says Jesus is the Father. And you can show them 30, 40 clear verses from the New Testament, but they've made up their mind on the basis of poetic verses from the Old Testament that they don't even understand. Because Abaddon the Father of Eternity, and Isaiah 9, 6 most certainly does not mean God the Father. It means he's the Father, meaning he's the creator of eternity, or alternatively, he's the possessor of eternity. The, I'll slow down, or the possessor of eternity, or, or quite likely both. He's the creator of eternity who now possesses it. Um, so it really is very, very interesting. Um, so, yeah, I, I understand um, you have a... Um, personification of wisdom here in Proverbs 8. Um, um, but um, do, you, do you mind if I just go through my four four reasons why I'd see the Holy Spirit as, as personal? I, I have shown one, self-cognizance. I'd be quick. Do you mind if I do that, Rolf? No, by all means. Yeah. I mean, as long as you've got the time, we certainly have. Well, I do have to go by about um, el um, 11. But, um, um, that's fine, that suits you, Robert, because, um, yeah, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're interested to hear. Um, we can always speak again some other time. The first point is the Holy Spirit has self-cognizance. He speaks and says, I and me. And that's in clear teaching passages, didactic teaching passages. It's not some poetic book from the Bible. Um, he says, I and me, in Acts 13.2. He has self-will. Now, a rock, a stone, electricity, something that's impersonal, does not possess self-will. But the Holy Spirit forbids Paul from preaching in Asia in Acts 16.6, which I'll read. Now, when they had gone through Figria and the region of Galatia, Galicia, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know what's wrong with me today. I, I can't really see very well. 
Um, when they had gone through Figria, which I probably pronounced incorrectly, and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. So the Holy Spirit has self-will because he forbids Paul to preach in Asia. He has intellect. We read of the mind of the Holy Spirit in Romans 8.27. Um, the Holy Spirit can teach in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. And you can't teach if you don't have intellect. And finally, the Holy Spirit has emotion. Um, he can love. Romans 15, verse 30 talks about the love of the Holy Spirit. Well, if the Holy Spirit isn't it, like electricity, how can he love? How can he love us? If he's just an impersonal thing like a rock or a stone or a book. Um, I mean, I've, I've got my mug in front of me. I'm holding it in my hand. It's a plastic blue mug. I've just had a, a drink of tea. Now, that mug is impersonal. It's an it. It's not a he. I'm a he. You're a he. Jesus is a he. But my mug is an it. It's impersonal. It does not possess the four aspects of personality, self-cognizance, self-will, intellect and emotion. The Holy Spirit loves in Romans 15.30, but my blue mug that I'm holding in my hand can't love me. I can love my mug because I'm personal and I can choose to love my mug or a dog or another human being or God or whatever if I choose to do that. But my mug cannot love because it's impersonal. It is an it, not a he. The Holy Spirit can be grieved in Isaiah 63.10 and in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. And you can insult the Holy Spirit in Hebrews 10.29. Well, I'm holding this blue mug, plastic blue mug in my hand. How can I grieve this mug? How can I, ins how can I insult this mug? You cannot insult a plastic mug because it is impersonal. It doesn't possess personality. And finally, you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit in, in Mark. Um, I should know. I think it's Mark 3. Is it Mark 3? 28 and 29, I think. I remember scanning that into my computer yesterday, and I should have written it down as well. I'm getting old. <laughs> yes. Um, Mark 3. 28 and 29. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will, for, will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is, in, but is subject to eternal condemnation, because they said he has an unclean spirit. So, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you, you, you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit, which proves the Holy Spirit must be personal not impersonal because you can't insult or blaspheme or grieve or be loved by an impersonal thing like electricity which is an it only a he or a she a personal being can love can be grieved you can insult or you can blaspheme i can see the point you're making although um I would see it in a somewhat different light in that if it's a force sent forth by God, um, it's very much an extension of his ability and his intelligence, uh, his capability. And certainly when one recognizes, as did the, uh, the Jewish religious leaders, they could see God's active force working through Jesus Christ, who, who was a perfect human, but... You know, was limited by his physical body. He relied on the power that God gave him. Um, that obviously, when you see that um, wonderful works are being done in God's name, to turn around and say, well, this is the work of the devil, would be to blaspheme God himself, just as if, um, when the, the, exactly the same as they did with Jesus Christ, that they said, um, Oh, how did they? Yes, they said that what you're doing is by Satan's power. Um, 
it's really interesting when we were thinking of is that in Acts it speaks of the Holy Spirit being poured out on 120 different people. And again, we speak of Elizabeth being filled with Holy Spirit when she heard that Mary was uh, pregnant with Jesus. You know, you can't really be filled with a person. Well, then Jesus wouldn't be a person because Jesus is prophetically said to be poured out in Psalm 22, 14. He's, um, prophetically, the psalm is speaking of Jesus, uh, of, of Jesus Christ, uh, at the point of his death, says, I have been poured out like water in Psalm twenty two fourteen, And the Apostle Paul is also poured out in Philippians two seventeen and 2 Timothy 4, 6. So if being poured out means you're not a person, you're an impersonal it, then Jesus is not a person, he's an it. And Paul would also be an it. Um, and as, be, as for being filled, we can be filled with the fullness of God in Ephesians 3.19. Or filled with the fullness of Christ in Ephesians 1.23 and 4.10. So if being filled with the Spirit means the Holy Spirit is not a person, then the Father, God the Father, Jehovah, is not a person in Ephesians 3.19 because we can be filled with the fullness of God. And Jesus Christ isn't a person because we can be filled with the fullness of Christ. But I certainly would agree um, the Holy Spirit is in some sense um, the power of God and he is sent out by the Father. So I'd have no objection to that. But what I would see is the Holy Spirit is being sent out not as an, an impersonal it like electricity, but he would be a person he would be personal because he possesses the four aspects of personality. When he speaks and says me and I, that means he has self-cognizance. He has self-will because he forbids the apostles preaching in Asia, Acts 16.6. He has intellect. He has a mind in Romans 8.27, which rather confusingly, I don't wish to get sidetracked onto the Trinity, but um, uh, that wouldn't be a separate mind to the Father and the Son. Okay, It would be the same mind. And he also has emotion. He can love, Romans 15.30. He can be grieved, Isaiah 63.10. He can be insulted, Hebrews 10.29. And you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And it does say in the passage I read in Mark 3.29 that they are blaspheming the Holy Spirit, not blaspheming the Father. It, 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 it specifically says you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit in that particular verse and and if the holy spirit isn't it how can you blaspheme an it um i would see the holy spirit sorry i i, I would see the holy spirit as god but let me just pause there if you wish to respond to anything sorry i didn't quite catch so i just wondered if you wanted to respond no, no, not at this point. No, I'm, no. I'm sorry, I'm listening and, and thinking over. Like I said, it's a long time since I've been involved in anything like a discussion on this. I, I would see the Holy Spirit as being revealed in the Bible as, as God. Um, in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, we read in verse 3 that Ananias had lied to the Holy Spirit. But in Acts 5, 4, we read, you have not lied to men, but to God. So my conclusion is, the Holy Spirit in verse 3 must be God of verse 4. I'll just read it. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit in Acts 5.3, but then he's specifically told by the Apostle uh, Peter in verse 4, you have not lied to men, you've lied to God. So my conclusion is the Holy Spirit must be God, which means as God is a he, and that does not refer to gender, masculine or feminine. It refers to the position of male headship. Okay. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is referred to 
um, being God. Sorry, I'm finding it difficult today. Um, I, I'm. Um, yeah, just my eyes aren't were working very well. I'm sorry. Um, that I would just see the Holy Spirit as God. That that's what I wanted to say. Thank thank you, Ralph. Yeah, no, I, I can see the points you're making, and I can appreciate that some of the scriptures that we've looked at, um, why you would take them the way you do. Um, I mean, we're fast running out of time. Yeah. I think we're in an area where it's, I, I can understand your reasoning, it's making sense. Um, I can't say I agree with it with the greatest of respect. Um, uh, how can I put this? Um, it's not the area that is the easiest to work around and to explain, being fair. Um, but uh, you obviously have researched it extremely well, and uh, I, I can see the points you're making. Um, I think in this area, to some extent, we, we have to sort of say, well, we'll agree to disagree, because I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I don't quite see it in the same light. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK, um, no, that's that's absolutely fine. I do think with the Bible, what you need to do is over the years. And I've been I was baptized in 1985 in an Assemblies of God church in London. And I'm afraid the older I've got, the more cynical I've become as to what I have seen um, in the evangelical movement. That's not to say there aren't genuine Christians in each of the evangelical churches, but um it seems that for every genuine Christian you find, there seem to be a lot of hangers-on and people who don't take it seriously. Do you understand what okay. I'm saying? I would agree with you 100%, yeah. Um, I found your book, Enjoy Life Forever, interesting. So when we speak again, it might be best to think about what's been said and maybe not come back to it for a month or two. Could we look at another <laughs> chapter from your book, Enjoy Life Forever? Mm. Right. Now, there's chapter 15, the first point, which mentions Colossians 1.15, if you'd like to look at that. Chapter 17, I'm just going through the book now, looks interesting. What is Jesus like? Although chapter 18, how to identify real Christians, would be another one. Could I leave those thoughts with you and get back to me, Ralph, when you want to speak? Uh, I can never speak Sunday and Monday afternoon and evening. And at the moment, I might be moving flat. So I'm going to be really busy, possibly, over the next few... few. It's best for you to text me a time way in advance, and if it's not convenient, I can get back to you. I have tried to absorb what you said. We will do our best. Certainly, texting is a nice, simple way to communicate. And if at any time I pick a time that's not convenient to you, you only have to come back, as yes. you said, I'm reasonably flexible. Although I'm retired, we are very active. Yes. Um, but yeah, with pleasure. Um, uh, and give me an exact chapter you'd like me to read, because I will read the chapter. Uh, um, I don't need to tell you. I'll go through it very, very... I'll read it more than once. I think I don't need to tell you that. So yeah. choose a chapter that you want me to look at. I, we looked at something that I found interesting today. Maybe you'd like to choose something that you find interesting next time. But I've indicated to you I found those three chapters, 15... 17 and 18 interesting, but maybe you want to look at something else. Well, I, I must admit one of the subjects I find most um, interesting to consider is that subject, How to Identify Real Christians, Chapter 18. Uh, and perhaps if it, if it suited you, it would be nice, nice to, 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 to look at that. All right. We might not be able to do it in one sitting. Might need Obviously. two goes to go through it. But OK, I will, I will read that chapter. And you just text me um, a time. I guess evenings might be best because I'm I'm here, there and everywhere at the moment. Understood. Um, right. I must admit the evenings are the times when we normally sit down as a twosome and uh, do scriptural research. So in many regards, the mornings are better for me. Um, is, is, is there any morning that, that works best for you? Um, uh, the exercise I tend to be 
<laughs> yes, yes, I can. I can certainly do the mornings. Just text me. Give me lots of notice way in advance. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. It's been really nice to thank talk, you. and it's um, given me some mental exercise, which I haven't had in a long time. So, um, you know, it's been really nice to talk to you, Robert, and uh, hopefully we'll be back in contact shortly. Okay. Thank you, Ralph and Shirley. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye now. Bye, Shirley. Bye-bye.